Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window. So happy to have you here. So happy to see you guys. Oh my gosh. Bree, welcome in. Bree coming in with the first. <laughs> yes. Okay. So before we get started, and I'll probably have to repeat this, but I have to I have to give you guys an apology. I tried. I tried very hard, but Sims 2 will not load today. I don't know what's happening. It's a very old game. Sometimes shit just is what it is. So, you know, I'm, I know YouTube, sorry for dropping a, a bomb within the first minute of the, of the video, um, but, you know, it was required because I rebooted my computer, no lie, like three times. I tried to start the game like six yeah. times. It didn't load. It didn't work. Um, so we're just, but we're still going to talk about the topic because we still prepared all of these notes and citations and dang it, we're going to do this. Even if we're going to be using, um, a little bit more boring format where you're just going to look at our faces, but hopefully that's okay. I mean, I know I look pretty cute today. I think Landon definitely looks cute today. She looks cute every day. Karen <laughs> chose the color of my eyeshadow. It's green. And I did. I made sure she matched our background and everything. So, yeah. you know, that's that about that. <laughs> I also really appreciate that we're slithering colors right now on the stream. Of course. I mean, <laughs> obviously we're going to do the whole timeline, y'all. Um, but you know, you know what the second hour is going to be, which, and that's like, you know, it, we got some real evil vibes that are yep. going to be happening today. <laughs> yeah, we figured we'd just embrace the evilness when roasting the shit out of JKR. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Landon, can you um, explain exactly what it is that we're going to talk about today? Yes, today we are going to talk about the rise and fall of Joanna Kathleen Rowling mm -hmm. uh, and her rise to fame and the wondrous uh, popularity she got when she produced the Harry Potter series and throughout the publication of their series and then the quick descent into, oh God, it's JKR uh, uh -huh. that she has found herself in now and how did that happen? Uh, when, how, uh, when did J.K. Rowling be the hero long enough to become the villain? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll tell you exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I know for a lot of uh, younger younger fans of, of Harry Potter or people that never got into Harry Potter, it can be kind of difficult to understand like what really happened. But lucky for you guys, I'm old and I was there the whole time. So <laughs> we're going to get into it and explain the whole thing of what happened from, you know, from some fans perspective that are really deeply into Harry Potter. I think I think we should also maybe warn you guys that there will be this. We're not going to like be emotional about it. This is shit that has happened, but there will be a little high emotions because this is the first time that I've at least gotten the opportunity to really talk about like all of the shit in mm -hmm. order and how much it affected me as a fan, but also me as like part of the demographics in which that she decides to shit on. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it'll mm -hmm. be it'll be really interesting. There'll be lots of spicy hot takes a lot of fuck turfs all that kind of stuff yeah now of course neither of us are um are strictly trans or anything like that yeah. um but that being said i have had my struggles with gender we have a whole um interstage window episode about it you can go find it there landon of course is part of the lgbt community and so it's very easy for us to feel solidarity with um with our trans friends also so. we care about human beings in general and i mean <laughs> being able to live the life that expresses your true self so mm -hmm. like fuck that right mm -hmm, for real <laughs> welcome in lunar thank you so much for lurking while you're working I um we mochi. love that I also saw Mochi. Hello, Mochi. Yes. Hey, Mochi. How's it going? I love those. Is that is that Ace flag? I love those those Ace flag oh, hearts. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh no, it's non-binary. Oh no, it's non-binary. Okay. Yeah, oh, we'll love those non-binary hearts exactly. especially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. But yes. Okay. But before we start with this heavy, heavy Saturday topic, let's talk about favorite things. Okay. Okay, I've got my favorite thing for this week. So if you're exhausted by um, the celebrity of JK Rowling, I've got a celebrity that's much less exhausting, that's just like 90% fun, you know, if you don't think too hard about it, right? And that is Paris Hilton. So if you have not oh watched God. yet, if you have not watched yet, Paris Hilton has a cooking show on Netflix and it is the most magical thing you have ever 
scene. And you know what? You know how I know Paris Hilton? It, she's either an ally or she, or at least she can read the room. She has Demi Lovato on one episode. She doesn't misgender Demi once. It is they, them the entire time, and it's magical. I'm just I, saying. Paris can do it. So. Okay. There's a, that's a hot take. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but Paris has had her problematic history. Uh, that I think that erasing would not be a good idea. But the show, <laughs> real fun. But do you know um, what's funny about Paris Hilton? Her most problematic thing that she gets railed for never even happened. Like her, we, you know, then she's she's up like with her arms up and she's like, um, stop being poor in that t-shirt. That photo's totally photoshopped. That oh, shirt yeah, doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but there were there were some there were some not great, but then again, the early 2000s were not a great time to be existing in. Uh, no, they weren't. <laughs> she's perhaps changed and developed, and that's great. I I think that she is by far one of the smartest business women that have come out. Uh, yes, she had a leg up being an heiress and all, but she has she has taken her brand and has let it last for twenty years, and now has TV shows on Netflix. So, and, and the one thing of the is, top podcasts in the world. And the thing that's wonderful about about Paris Hilton, you know, I mean, eat the rich, of course, like if it comes to that, sorry, Paris, you're on the menu, but I'm just she's, saying. She's an appetizer. <laughs> she's not even an appetizer. I think she's like the drink that you get when you walk into a fancy place. Yeah. She's so tiny that she wouldn't even be an appetizer. That's all but like. Saying. But like, here's the thing, Paris still knows how to read the room and the entire show, she's reminding you, don't worry, you can do anything. She can't cook either. And look, she manages to have a cooking show where she just hangs out with her friends. So I, you know what? You can truly do anything in life. This sounds so wonderful. I will have to It's really good. The show, like legitimately, I'm kind of making fun of it a little bit, um, but I'm more dunking on myself for how much I enjoyed it. It's like, it's like legitimately a really good show. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's junk food TV, right? And yes. that's, that's sometimes in the world in which we have a pandemic and that's issues are happening. We need junk food TV. And if yeah. your junk food TV is The Bachelor or Paris Hilton or Cooking with Paris, life's good, right? Yeah. Put it on while you're working on like a really boring spreadsheet at work or something. And you'll be so much happier while you work on that spreadsheet. <laughs> you'll just so that's my favorite thing this week. <laughs> yes. Uh, Landon, what's your favorite thing this week? Uh, I feel that I have hit my white girl prime this week because mm. uh, pumpkin spice lattes are back at Starbucks. And I understand that this is like the fourth time I've said Starbucks for my favorite things, but that just shows me. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie. You haven't said it in a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, but it's the pumpkin spice latte. So not only did the pumpkin spice latte come, come back this week, but also Halsey put out an album. Uh, so she I'm, did. Just living, I'm just living my witchy fall vibes life at the very end of august when it is clearly not fall because it's 90 degrees outside you're just getting you're just getting started early i mean it's virgo season already right like virgo season started and that's basically the start of fall exactly and if people can sit there and start celebrating christmas in july i could celebrate halloween in august well if you don't get started in august you're not going to have a bang in costume by how by time halloween comes around so you know this is true. <laughs> See, Bree, thank you for agreeing with me. Yes. Um, um, but anyone stream Halsey, just do it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Podcast? Just kidding. She's not. Um, <laughs> that would be so cool, though. But yeah. It would. Oh, my God. Actually, Halsey doesn't know we exist. <laughs> she's very aware that I exist. She's my future wife. No. But <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Those are my favorite things. All right. Um, Do we want to start? I was going to say, just reminding him at the beginning, and we'll remind them at the end. Also, we're going to have a party next Saturday for 200 200, uh, followers here on Twitch. So Mm -hmm. that's my favorite thing upcoming. True. True. So that party, just to remind everybody the way it's going to work, is we're still going to do our normal interstage window episode, which is going to be Mulan versus Mulan, the two Disney versions of Mulan. We're really excited to talk about that with you guys. So we're going to do that regular episode, but then at four o'clock, we're going to stop the stream, 
and then, or sorry, at two o'clock, we're going to stop the stream and then restart it. And then we're going to go through four more hours and we're going to play a party game. So we're going to be playing Among Us and we're going to be playing some Jackbox. And um, just like we did with the other party, uh, that VOD isn't going to get posted anywhere. It'll stay up on Twitch for a little bit, but then it will expire. So it's literally just time for us to hang out. Um, the content is gonna gonna be there and gone. You know, it's not gonna last just like a snapchat So it's really just a party for us and I hope everybody is going to be able to come Yes, Brie, please and bring summer with you um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I know and, and I by the way like twitch. I mean not twitch uh, zoom keeps freezing I don't know why that's happening, but if I switch the camera around it fixes it so um, sorry guys that y'all keep getting frozen landed I'm, fi I'm fix it every time I notice but um, it's it, I don't know what's going on with that that's not good. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. Or we'll okay. just, I'll just be frozen. I'll have to always well, just be smiling. Well, chat yell at me if it's <laughs> been like over 30 seconds and I haven't noticed because I'm trying to catch it every time. <laughs> um. All right. Shall we get into the rise and fall of Joanne Kathleen Rowling? Yes. Okay. So we have to start at the beginning, you guys. We have to actually start at the rise. So um we have to start at the early 2000s which i was in high school at this time you know um this was uh this was like 9 11 times like things were things were different so i just kind of want to set the stage for you so that you can understand what it was like in the early 2000s um and and how you know lgbt people would have potentially felt of course it varies very much by where you live but in general um, you know, FAG, that slur was, um, was very popular. You don't really hear that so much anymore, but at that time that was like the go-to if you wanted to just be mean to someone, that was the slur you used. Um, you know, that's gay. That was your way of saying that's stupid. And that's just kind of how it was. Like even LGBT people would say that's gay. It, it was part of the culture at that time. And so, you know, the culture was not super friendly. It was not super yeah. friendly to LGBT people to say the least, just in general. You know, if yeah. you watch comedies from then, you'll see you'll see a lot of really bad gay and trans jokes. Um, and that can give you some idea of like how it was in general. Just go pick any random comedy from around that time. I guarantee there will be at least be one anti-LGBT joke. Yep. Um, definitely, definitely the butt of most jokes. Um, being bisexual wasn't even considered a real thing. No, um, like if you were, so, uh, if you were a bi girl, you were pretending. You yeah, pick a side eventually. <laughs> Not even picking a side attention, uh, like, uh, like even picking a side, it was the idea that you were getting attention for men to find men, uh, to, for men to find you attractive because it was okay to make out with girls if it was for the purpose of a man enjoying it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what they assumed the purpose was a lot of times. Oh, yeah. And if there was, if you were a bi man, then you were using bisexuality as a stepping stone into being gay. Yeah. Uh, so there weren't even a lot of out bi men in the world in general. There were a lot more, it was a lot more um, acceptable to be bi and female but even then it was considered a phase for the pleasure of a man yeah uh yeah yeah yep. exactly it was so fetish, fetish and the truth and the truth is and like and we say we can say all of that about like um you know bi people and how bi people were perceived but for trans people it was even worse um in high school i didn't even know what that was like i gotta be honest like i didn't know what that was um i have a, a high school friend who was who was a gay man at the time we were in high school this person is now a woman, a straight woman, because like, we just didn't know. And neither this person I'm talking about, neither did she, like, she didn't know either. Like she didn't know that existed or that was an option for her. You know, looking back, it is very painfully obvious. <laughs> However, at the time we just, we just didn't know. And so, you know, that's, that's part of, that's part of the, the, the climate. So the truth is it didn't take much to be an ally in the early 2000s. It really didn't. Um, and J.K. Rowling performed it perfectly. And she was set up to perform it perfectly because like she also came from this idea of poverty. She was on food stamps. She was a single mother. 
um, and therefore she she was aware of the marginalized people and had that level of empathy because she has she was a victim of the broken system mm -hmm. right and so that automatically that idea that she came from nothing in the eyes of people automatically projected a level of empathy onto her that she didn't necessarily have it was projected simply because of the story of her growth well i think also it was very at that time we knew she understood what it was like to be marginalized but of course you know, we've all met the marginalized person that still holds hatred in their heart that is still a bigot. You know, yep. being being put upon by the world yourself doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to always uh, do or think the right thing. And of course, we know now in hindsight, but at the time, at the time, we didn't necessarily know, like we, you don't know what someone ha has in their heart. You, we only knew what was in the books and what she said in interviews. We, we didn't yep. know the full story. And remember, like I said, in the early 2000s, like most of us, we didn't even know what trans was. So you do think, yeah. do you think anyone was asking JK Rowling her opinion on trans people at Hogwarts? Like it was rare. I think there's like one instance where it came up. You know, and, and she just basically I, I, said, sure, you know. Yeah, and it wasn't until, it wasn't until, and we'll get into the timeline of where J.K. Rowling started editorializing things, but that, that asking st stuff like that didn't start happening and her answering those questions didn't start happening until after the publication of the books. Mm -hmm. So her allyship existed purely outside of book canon. Yeah. And was just really like low level because that's where we were in the early 2000s yeah they were they were considered you know, ya books um yep. you know if she and then and the the point at, at that time like we all believed oh she's an ally and she would have written more better things in regards to her lgbt characters and and uh characters of color you know if that was more acceptable like that's literally what we thought we were wrong but that's what we thought yeah. <laughs> Bri, i'm loving your energy in the chat by the way um i'm loving all your comments those are really good and it was it was that expectation right and, I, and again that's why i'm like using terms of projecting we because i think also harry potter and i've said this several times has like the people that are attracted to Harry Potter were the kids who felt like Harry, who felt like the outcasts, who who felt like they wanted to find a place that they belonged. Now that could hit every kid at various different levels, which is why it was so universal. But the people that held on to Harry Potter with all of their might tend to be kids who are in the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, I, I look at like the adult Harry Potter fans and I go, ha. Huh, 90% of them are gay or some yeah. <laughs> they're all uh, girls gays and days the like all of them <laughs> and the story is literally about a, a boy who grew up, grew up in the closet having to hide a part of who he was mm -hmm. right like there is an allegory there that could be um that could be you know code but it isn't because it obviously wasn't her intention no um, <laughs> but, but he literally comes out of the closet I mean that is the books so <laughs> but the, like that there is that sense of community that exists in there. So we sit there and be like, oh, of course, the person who we idolize would tell our story in a modern way if those stories existed in a modern time. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Uh, and we find that out later. So there was this idea of us as the fan base projecting more allyship views onto a woman that we didn't know. Yeah. We did it. Um, we, we were to we totally had a completely parasocial relationship with her, and because she was so she was so because she because she was poor, like it really was a Cinderella story. Like she was like that's not that's not a lie. It's not like she pretended she was poor. She really was, and and this this whole idea of like she was very grateful to her fans, so she wanted to answer all of our questions when we when we wanted things added. Um, to the canon when we wanted things expand like she wanted to do that and she made that very obvious by the way that she engaged with us as fans and that just made fans hungry for more so it became this like ridiculous feedback loop where she was just like constantly editorializing in, on Harry Potter just over and over and over but um there are there are like uh 
it, there were there were early criticisms. Um, breathe. I don't see that I'm dropping frames or anything. Try refreshing. Um, if the stream says it's still coming going fine from my end, sorry. I'm typing. I'll type it in there. Okay. Um, but there were criticisms early on, like because there's stuff in the books that is very clearly like fat phobic. We've even talked about it in the the episodes that we've done on uh, the first two books, right? And particularly in the our episode on the first book, we talked about it. Um, we haven't gotten to it yet, but when Rita Skeeter gets introduced, there were early criticisms of, you know, potential transphobia, right? But um, the people that said those things, that posted those things online, they were dogpiled and harassed out of the fandom for the most part like people would not hear it they would not hear any criticism of harry potter that could potentially be leveled at jk rowling herself the only criticisms that were allowed were of like the text you could not criticize rowling or people would just like destroy you and even then you couldn't criticize the text <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you wouldn't no. be run out of the fandom, but people would people would just argue with you a little bit more um, normally. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. and, and there was, and I think that this is the unique situation that really led to the fandom separating from uh, JK, JKR. It it set the foundation of that. It wasn't at that point yet. The time that we are talking about is when she was still publishing books. Uh, so the editorializing wasn't even that much because she wasn't reflecting on things. She still had books to come mm -hmm. uh, it, or in the la or in the year and movies to come, right? Yep. Um, so really there was, there wasn't any like, there th she hadn't started losing the fan base, but the fan base had started defending the world that she had created and they had projected to such high levels that the that they would dogpile over anybody who sat there and was like no jkr is being problematic in this mm -hmm, uh, her mm -hmm. lack of racist or her her racist um representation such as cho chang being the only uh, asian woman in the entire franchise being named cho chang had criticism in the fourth mm -hmm. and fifth book nobody listened to it it wasn't yeah. a big deal She's not racist, all of that kind of stuff. So that early separation and disagreement, I think really led the way for fandom to be able to separate, but it was a vicious time where nobody could disagree. Yeah, like heaven forbid you pointed out how awful it was that once they gave Lavender Brown lines in the movie, all of a sudden she became white. Like if you pointed that out, you were just told, well, it's the climate, it's the time, you know, the movies, blah, blah, wouldn't sell butts they and seats, wham, wham. The right, they wanted to find the right actress. Oh my god, yeah. The black actress wasn't the right actress because she was black? Like, <laughs> come on, guys. Like, there's um, black people in the UK. You could definitely find a black child that wanted to play Lavender Brown, even if they wanted to change the actress. It just, it's stupid. But so, if you said things like that at that at that time, um, you would get harassed out of the fandom. Like, people wouldn't, will, didn't want to hear it. And I'll sit there and I'll say, I was in the midst of this. I didn't want to hear criticism for, on Harry Potter. Because I was, I was in early high school, so I, I really like was love and obsessed with the books, middle school to early high school. I didn't have the larger imp like ideas of implications in the world. Um, the allyship that I was experiencing was that low level allyship of just like even acknowledging the existence of things is considering being an ally, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. so ridiculous to think about now to just be like, yeah, gay people exist is a form of I a allyship. Like, no, that's just a form of like, accepting reality um, <laughs> but at the time uh, I really thought that absolutely and at the time that's how our society was set up right mm -hmm. and and racism was the same way accepting the fact like simply sitting there and saying yeah things are racist was a form of allyship back then yeah uh, it's so sad that the bar was so low but but it was this acceptance of that yeah. um and that's where that happened and continued to happen until 2007, six yes. or seven. No, 2007, it's uh, July 2007. Yeah. Okay, so here's what happens next. July 2007, the last Harry Potter book is released. And so JK Rowling can kind of work on other things if she wants to, but she very quickly finds that nothing that she does really captures the public's imagination the way Harry Potter did. So she just continues to work on, on the movies 
and um, and develops um, other stuff for Harry Potter and does a bunch of interviews for Harry Potter, right? So that's that's July two thousand seven. So then here's the first event, right? It was, October, it was the big one. <laughs> yeah, October twentieth two thousand and seven. Dumbledore is gay. So I'm just going to show you guys. Here we go. So you can see my screen. October, this is October 20th, 2007. And this is, um, this is from ABC News. Uh, there was, there's tons of articles on this. This is just an example. So Landon, if you could put a link to this in the chat for us. Um, I'm like, frozen, just so you know. Sorry? I'm also frozen. Oh, no, no, you're not. Oh, never mind. I came back. Never mind. Okay. Um, so, so basically, uh, J.K. Rowling is in an interview, and um, and she says Dumbledore is gay, and um, I'm just pulling the quotes out here. Okay, so in fact, recently I was in a script read through for the sixth film, and they had Dumbledore saying the line to Harry, Harry early in the script, saying, "I knew a girl once whose hair." The crowd laughed. I had to write a little note in the margin and slide it along to the scriptwriter. Dumbledore is gay. So this is one of those things that's just like, it's not in the book. There are no hints about Dumbledore's love life. We know, we know nothing about his love life or sex life in the book. It is, it's not a thing. <laughs> um, and why, why should it be? Why would Carrie, why would Harry care about his, you know, headmaster's love life? He would not care. Um, but you know who would care? The people who wrote the book about him. Which, if it did, was mentioned in that, the book uh, from the seventh book, um, The Life and Lives of Albus Dumbledore, mm -hmm. uh, it would be mentioned in there. So she mm -hmm. had the incredible opportunity to mention this directly and chose not to. Yep. And three months later, after the publication, yeah. decides to announce it to the world that he is. Yes. So it is literally not canon. It is just an interview. And there's so many things around this time, around that that kind of like um, mid to late 2000s that um, that it, that aren't canon. They just exist in interviews, right? This is just like the quintessential example. And, and this is the one that blew up, right? And it's kind of the beginning of the end because she gets criticism from both sides. Now, she had always gotten criticism from conservatives, right? Um, for, for a variety of reasons that we don't need to rehash and is not super relevant. Yeah, <laughs> not super relevant to what we're talking about. Now. But now she's getting criticism from her more liberal or left leaning fans as well. When they say like, very cool. Thank you. So where is it? You know, so you've got like this group of hardcore fans that are like, wow, amazing. One of the characters actually is LGBT. Fantastic. This thing that I had hoped for it exists. But then you've got some other, um, you know, a little bit older fans saying, so, so, um, ma'am, ma'am, um, where is it? Where, where yeah. is it? <laughs> it? I think that there was also this turning of the tides. Like we went from early 2000s to the later 2000s so the idea of, ex of of just saying that gay people exist suddenly not being enough mm -hmm. um suddenly not being enough of a like allyship sort of thing where you can't just say hey gay people are real people too as a form of allyship and i think that that's when the tide was turning and this was the perfect example of it because you saw some people with that same, that old belief of being like, oh, thank you so much for including a gay person in your books. And then there were some people who were like, where is the gay? Like you're just <laughs> saying a thing and nothing has actually stated in book. There is no actual representation. Yes. Um, and, and it was this interesting shift in, I think, culture that was happening at the same time as her doing this. Yep. Yep. So you've got this, you've got this couple of years here in between, um, you know, at the end of the Harry Potter books and the end of the Harry Potter movies. And it, and JK Rowling kind of realizes like, oh, shoot, what I've been doing is not enough anymore. And everyone still wants me to talk about Harry Potter. So what am I going to do? And that's, and that's where the, this type of take starts to come out. And, and this really fractures the fandom in a way that, um, we hadn't seen before. Now, criticisms of J.K. Rowling herself 
are kind of on the table. People are kind of interested in it and they're okay with it. You're not getting run out of the fandom anymore for saying that she's imperfect. Whereas before this, I feel like that was what was happening. And, and now it's not that people aren't still idolizing her. They absolutely are. This is just the beginning of the end because now criticisms are allowed and people are going, well, I could see that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe you are right. I don't know. You're seeing a little bit more of that. Or maybe instead of getting totally dogpiled and run out of the fandom, people criticizing are getting just ignored, um, you know, instead. So you're not getting like harassed out of the fandom. If you say JK Rowling is fat phobic, you're just kind of getting like, I don't know, maybe, you know, and it's a, it's, it's just very slowly over those couple of years as the last few movies came out. Um, things just, the mood was just different. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I, and I think that that's like came with society, right? Uh, society, very fat phobic. Uh, yeah. when even was more so in the 20, in the t early 2000s. And then we started realizing, hey, fat people are people too. Um, and, and the same continues. So as society transformed and changed slowly over time, uh, it, it really brought to light how, how weak these levels of allyship were yeah uh, and people and if people didn't grow with them uh it became very apparent how much of an ally they weren't mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep so that was really in 2007 was the first time we were like oh uh joanne are you uh you you all right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> an ally but there's not a lot of proof here Mm-hmm. Yep. And um and she still and she still maintained that she was an ally. And for the most part, at this point, people did still believe that she was. It's not that people didn't think she was an ally. They just thought like, well, maybe she's kind of out of touch, you know, and it's not that she doesn't care about her, you know, marginalized fans or that she doesn't want to uplift them. It's just like maybe she doesn't maybe she doesn't know how. She doesn't get it. Um and that's fine. We still love her. You know, um yeah, and the arguments of that it was a kids book mm -hmm. and that 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 wasn't the point of the story and not all representation has to happen all of the time and mm -hmm. she can be an ally outside of the books and just because she doesn't have representation within the media doesn't mean she isn't a good person it became this really like personal thing that almost like if you were attacking harry potter you were attacking jkr mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and criticizing it and and if you were criticizing jkr then you were criticizing harry potter like it was this they were so closely tied um that they were the same thing almost yeah, so what Bree's saying, exactly, Bree. So she grew up in a different time. That's basically at yeah. this point, that's what the excuse became. So it, instead of instead of everyone dogpiling you if you criticize JKR, it was it was much more gentle. It was like, well, you're right, but she grew up in a different time. So we still love her. It's okay, you know. Uh, and then uh, fast forward a few years and a couple novel attempts later that did not hit success. <laughs> uh, we come to 2012. Mm-hmm. On April 14th of 2012, uh, Pottermore, which is the website that J.K. Rowling uh, launched in terms of seeing behind the scenes uh, information about the writing process of Harry Potter uh, was launched. And it was also really the moment that people started getting real tired of her shit. Yeah. Uh, because this in those, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, this is, this is the joke, right? Um, it, once this launched and we all took the quiz and maybe you didn't get the house that you wanted or you thought the quiz was stupid, this is when the joke became, maybe JK Rowling should Potter less. Yes. <laughs> uh, which is, yes. Um, God, she should have. But also I think what was, what was part of this, so that it wasn't even just the quizzes, what it was, it was in-depth stories of characters that the fandom had taken in the, you know, 12, the, the 14 years of Harry Potter publication and all, but specifically since 2007, since the Dumbledore and Gaze incident, since the last book published, the fandom thrived. They took all of these side adventures, created these characters. Tumblr was at the height of, of its uh, existence. Um, things like AO3 and fanfiction.net and different fan fiction sites were very popularized uh, during that time. So the fandom had really taken the stories, created their own, and then JKR 
five years later came through and was like, these are the real stories. It was very frustrating for somebody that spent my post Harry Potter books time getting super into the Marauders era, um, yeah. only to be told like, oh here's the head cannons that you got right and here's the head cannons that you got wrong no fuck you my head cannons are right you can't tell me <laughs> well it's, and it's that idea that when you as an author publish a book at the moment it is published and put to somebody else's hands it is no longer yours and jkr never learned that lesson she never understood that because the harry potter fandom took what she writ she wrote and sprinted with it and she was like no but that's not what i meant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she had yeah wolf star <laughs> wolf star being a huge one. Oh my gosh the and like there's a lot of controversy with wolf star in general but the fact that she told the actor to play remus as gay uh because her intention was that remus be gay and then when sirius and and remus the wolf star shit became popular within the fandom she felt uncomfortable with that happening to her characters. Uh, and that happened even earlier in publishing since because she then wrote Remus into a relationship that made no sense. Um, <laughs> and it only, it makes sense in fandom. In canon, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, but anyways. In fandom, it made no sense. But in fandom, absolutely. Um, and and went with it. So it, it's a lot. It is a lot of uh, her having this idea of ownership and then trying to keep that ownership we're talking five years half a decade after the last publication yep yep and i think that there's two there's two reasons main reasons that this happened so and and i don't necessarily 100 percent blame jk rowling so one of the reasons is her fault and one of them is like legit it's our fault okay as fans so the first part is that she tried to write some other stuff and no one cared and no one liked it. So the first problem is, unfortunately, we all learned that JK Rowling is actually not good at most things except describing locations. So we only care when she's writing this fantastical magical world that we can be like, woo, I want to go there. She writes anything realistic. It's like, meh, who cares? You know, <laughs> Yeah. so, but then the other problem is, is like we as fans, like we asked for this. Like, I don't know. I don't know how much everybody remembers, but like, we acted like we wanted this. We constantly were asking her these questions in interviews. We were constantly tweeting this stuff at her. Like, we wanted it. We were thirsty for more J.K. Rowling version of Harry Potter. And then, like, and then, of course, because nothing else took off, she gave it to us. And then we were all mad. And it's like, and I know, like, J.K. Rowling probably didn't have the foresight to realize that would happen, even though now it's so obvious. And that's why most authors don't do what she did. They just let it be and just don't answer these types of questions from fans. But she didn't know, and neither did we. And then, you know, all throughout those late 2000s and um, and early 2010s, we're just constantly getting shoveled, you know, more Harry Potter shit that we don't want. And we can't even be like, we didn't ask for this because we did ask for it. We just didn't realize what we were asking for because we were young and stupid. I I disagree on a small level to that because yes, we were asking for it 110%. Uh, but what we also like, but like she also came at it with the aggressiveness. Yes. That, and possessiveness that she said, as soon as it was published, it was law. Yeah, it, it was very symbiotic in that way. Like as we made her feel like that was okay to behave that way. Yeah. As soon as she said, you cannot like Draco Malfoy because he's an evil person. Um, if people liked Draco Malfoy, she then would personally attack fans. Yeah, same thing like, for with um, people that love Severus Snape as a as a Snape stand. Yeah. I saw a lot of that. It's so funny nowadays. It's so funny nowadays because um, the only actor that still will do any Harry Potter stuff that still won't denounce her is is Felton. Everyone else has left her side. So anyway, I just think that's funny. <laughs> oh, Tom. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was, it, I think it was a combination. We absolutely were asking for it and not realizing what we were getting. We didn't realize we had the monkey's paw upon us, mm -hmm. but she came at it with such ownership and velocity and just, and just possessiveness 
that as soon as Pottermore came out and people started sitting there and being like, nah, I'm good. I don't need that. She started getting angry and bitter about it. Yes. Yes. And um, sometimes her anger and some, mm-hmm. and sometimes we liked her anger. Like I've got a, I've got a beautiful example here of a time that she got angry at a fan and we were like, yeah. Um, which, which kind of primes her for how she acts now, but just, just wait for this one. Who remembers this gem? Um, this gem right here where she's responding to this tweet, uh, criticizing gay Dumbledore and her response is maybe because gay people just look like people. And we were like, woo, queen, yes, go off. You know, I mean, we didn't say those words because that wasn't the slang in 2015, but you get what I'm saying. Like we were into it. Like, see, oh my God, I love you. Like that was the response, you know? So we're like, yes, get angry. And there was an extent of that, but it's, and, but like, she heard that yay, get angry and was like, ah, people are back on my side. And yes. Reality, like maybe because gay people just look like people is still not allyship, Joanne. It's that's not. Still not that's still not, that is, exist, that is, and that is still the base level of early 2000s uh, allyship, which is admitting that people exist. Like mm-hmm. that's it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So, so really, it, it, she got possessive, she got angry, she started fighting back, uh, she started criticizing her own fans, her own fans' work. Uh, so while we did ask for this, there was a certain level of, to a point where it was like, okay, you need to also stop. Yeah. And also like for me, it was kind of, I, I saw this and I started getting really nervous because when I was, you know, a little, a little baby, a little fandom baby, um, I was aware of like, if you were part of the, um, Anne Rice, like vampire books, like those books, if you were part of that fandom and you wrote fanfic, like they would go after you if they didn't like your fanfic. And so like, um, and that's why a lot of old fanfics, you see like these disclaimers that are like a mile long and sound really stupid, but it's because we were all scared of Anne Rice. But anyways, <laughs> um, so I started seeing this and and I, I remember at this time I started to get really nervous and I was like, oh my God. So for, for like me personally, this is when I started to be like, hmm, I am not so I'm this is not cool (laughs) maybe I can just like Harry Potter and not be super into JK Rowling you know so this this was the beginning of the end for me when I started seeing her fight with fans over Potter more right um so that you kind of know my my personal thoughts on it you know before this some of the other stuff I was just like meh whatever like I didn't take it seriously I didn't realize it was going to turn serious and get crazy but this is when I started being like oh ouch (laughs) I started, I started getting real tired of, at Dumbledore is gay. Um, but as soon as Pottermore came out, it was the beginning of the end for me. When I saw also how like, how she didn't take into consideration all this work fandom did. Why should she? She's not in the fandom. Mm-hmm. But th- from my perspective as, as like, a, it was, I was a senior, right? As a high school senior, I was like, why isn't she taking into consideration all of this world building and acceptance that we have done as a fandom and love and it's still making a place where it's like serious black is not gay i'm sorry in what world was serious black not gay i mean obviously he was <laughs> and, he well, and, character. It, and we'll get to that in the, in the third as we dissect the third one but <laughs> and 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 by then of course like i had spent so much time playing with the marauders characters yeah. um because y'all know from like spare room episodes i've talked about this i love to take characters that are just like barely mentioned um and you only get a few facts about them and expand them right so to me like marauders was like this wonderful playground Um, set up for me in this world that I loved with characters that I could flesh out with my friends and um, and it was just it was beautiful you know and I think most people were obsessed with Marauders in that in that golden age too absolutely Um, of golden age of fandom not golden age of Harry Potter yeah Um, I love this comment from Brie also I say she didn't realize that once she put stuff out there it was no longer hers everyone else got to have a say in it too maybe not canonically but she lost the plot thinking she had the last say and what entire groups of people would continue to believe right and more talented authors understand that and don't do the kind of things that she did I think she also thought that if she said it it is canon and the reality is is that it's not canon Mm -hmm. is the source she is not the source the Mm-mm. books are the source. The text is the so, source. So Tweets are not text. <laughs> anything that she can sit there and say, well, everything on Pottermore is canon. It's not. It's not in the books. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to pull Minerva McGonagall's backstory about how she had a husband and her husband died and she had no children and all of this, like none of that is in the books. 
Nope. And therefore, none of it is canon. It's how she developed the characters 110%, but it is not canon. Yep. Um, and and I think that she didn't have that understanding. No, that- she didn't. And But she really, but her actions convinced me that things like that are not canon. Interviews are not canon. Okay, tweets are not canon. Extra information on websites are not canon. And the reason I believe that, that is all 100% due to J.K. Rowling. Um, if it weren't for all of this, I might be able to hear arguments about like, no, interviews are canon. No, disagree. I will never believe that after these experiences I've had with Harry Potter. Um, and so we move on from, from that. When people are getting real tired of JKR, they're no longer really listening to her about Harry Potter things. The fandom is exploding in its own right. We're all kind of like, yeah, like we, we've almost grown up at this point where we're all like adults just looking at JKR and being like, I'm so glad of your opinion. I'm going to go somewhere else. Pretty much. Um, it's like, it's like, all right, grandma, let's go to bed now. Yeah, That's exactly. really nice. Uh, let's go sleep. Let's go to the other room and actually talk about this. Yes. Um, you know, in here, that's fine. And yeah, like it is that very much treating it like a grandma. And that happened for about three years. Uh, and then I am convinced, I am absolutely 110% convinced that JKR got so frustrated with the fact that she no longer had control over her fandom uh, and was no longer able to produce anything else that she sat there and was like, well, then I will make actual canon works. Uh, So a couple things happened during that time. The first was Cursed Child. Mm -hmm. Uh, Although she wasn't, she wasn't really involved in that. I mean, but I love this head canon, but she wasn't really. (laughs) No, but she put her name on it. She put her name on it. She did. She signed off on it. it Like she calls it canon and it is not canon, but she disagree. Disagree. Bella Dolph is forever. Sorry. Bella Mort is boring. Anyways. She, she grasped (laughs) at that last bit of power that she thought she had and was like, if I put my name on a book because they published a book version of it, it is then officially canon. Yeah, and then no one likes the book version. The only people that like it is because they saw the play, and the play version apparently is, is good, play, but reading it is awful. The play is beautiful simply for the like, the magic of theater and not the plot. The plot is shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep, and then what no. comes after Cursed Child, Landon? What comes next? The Crimes of Grindelwald. Uh, yes. So we have the Fantastic Beasts. So we have the Fantastic Beasts movies. And I mean, the first one is fine. Like people really, people like it. It's okay. Not a problem. Actually, the first one I actually enjoyed. You want to know yeah. why? It took place in a very different time. It had none of the same characters. No. And I thought like the take on Newt was pretty cool. Like I thought it was the an interesting on, take. The take on Wizarding World America was fascinating. There's a lot of issues yeah. I have with it. If you want to hear my school headcanon, I will 100% tell you, but not at this moment. Yeah, but um, luckily, luckily, the, the, the school as it's described on Pottermore doesn't really exist in Fantastic Beasts, thank that's God, true. because that's, it's the worst. But anyways, maybe we should talk about that in another episode for we'll sure. Do, we'll do that. <laughs> but, but, yes, um, but where things really start to melt down is Crimes of Grindelwald, because here it is. Here it is. Dumbledore is gay. Here, it, oh my God, guys, we're going to get Dumbledore is gay. And then what happens? Movie. He's not gay. He's not gay. He's not gay. Where's the gay? Oh, no, 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 no. Karen, wait. There is that one scene where Dumbledore, looking at the past of him in Grindelwald, as Grindelwald slowly looks at him in the eye and goes, we were closer than brothers. (sighs) Oh, sorry. sorry. I I fell asleep. (laughs) I fell fell asleep. (laughs) That is not the words, I'm gay. (laughs) Oh, my God. It was so embarrassing, y'all. It was so embarrassing for everybody involved. So sad. That is actually the moment. That is the that is the exact moment I left that theater, and I went. J.K. Rowling will never give me what I need. Nope. As a queer person, J.K. Rowling will never give me what I need. Yeah, and this is and this is something that we're gonna circle back to because we don't worry, we're about to get to the turf shit. Um, we're gonna circle back to it, but typically one form of bigotry begets another form of bigotry. People typically aren't bigots in just one way. They're working through all different kinds of forms of bigotry, right? Like the human brain is complicated and, and tribal, and you know all of these these things, right? We've y'all know this stuff. Um, so, you know, of of course, uh, even though she wants to be an LGBT ally, the truth is she's clearly uncomfortable with gay people. She mm-hmm. is. 
and and like i'm not saying that um that that's that that like she that like she's an evil person for that um i hope she's working on it but i don't have much faith that she is considering the stuff she has to say about trans people but um but yeah it's clear that she's deeply uncomfortable with gay people otherwise yep. dumbledore would have been gay it was freaking 2018 well, Yep. It was 2018. Well, okay, so we still Warner Brothers is also, I mean, it's all also Hollywood. So that that was the whole excuse too. Is that it? I mean, and even Joanne said that that it was it was hot. Like she hinted towards it, she never said it. Um, but it was Hollywood. It was it was the fact that they don't want uh, a main pivotal character to be gay, uh, which is fucking ridiculous. But it's so stupid because the because like, the the gay scene in this movie is less gay than other stupid Disney gay scenes that aren't really that gay. Yeah. Like she couldn't even, she couldn't even like have them hug and cut away real quick. Like she couldn't even do, she, it was like, it was like the a, less, it was touch. less than the minimum. It or was less than like the minimum. Face touch. Like they, they couldn't. And it's, it's frustrating. Very and frustrating. At this point, uh, queer baiting. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, we have been told that this character is gay. And we have been watching two movies now for proof of it and have not seen it. And it's almost like she's like, mm, you know what I can get? I can get butts and seat if I tease along the LGBTQ uh, people. Yep. And the reality is, is that that's not, no, nope, it doesn't work. Yep. And uh, luckily, and luckily the once they, they've announced, once they make the third one, that they're taking an indefinite hiatus which means thank god these this really? bullshit's done yeah oh yeah there's only going to be thank one more fantastic god. beast movie you hadn't, hadn't heard that yet oh my god that's amazing. nobody wants nobody wants to work on I... it nobody wants to be attached to her yeah she... yeah <laughs> so yeah. um no it's oh that makes me so happy no and mm -hmm. it makes me i mean it makes me sad too because i will always want more harry potter content um I just by somebody else the, i just don't want the harry potter content that jk rowling provides yep so here's so um, at this point you know we're all starting to really get tired of jk rowling and oh, yeah. pretty much just like just Rolling. dunk on her people didn't hate her but they were they dunked on her so who remembers this gem who remembers this gem y'all let me show you guys so hogwarts didn't always have bathrooms before adopting mogul plumbing methods in the 18th century witches and wizards simply relieved themselves wherever they stood and vanished the evidence do y'all remember, like, do y'all remember that? Oh my god, this tweet and this post on, well, it's Wizarding World now, but this used to be Pottermore, I swear, this used to be Pottermore, they rebranded it, anyway. Um, do y'all remember this and you, how much fun we made of it? <laughs> you don't you don't oh, know yeah. the poop tweet? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, no, it's, oh, it's fucking just terrible. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to shout it out. There is amazing. If you ever just want to like shit on this, there's an amazing show called Misfits and Magic. It's a D&D <sighs> show, uh, but they literally just shit on all of the Harry Potter stuff. And this is a whole 30 minute bit. It's so a whole here's what it here's what this used to look like back when it was Pottermore. So you can see. Do y'all hear that music? <laughs> it's oh my terrible. God. It's that yeah and at this point we just like at this point it was like ah finally <laughs> grandma got dementia like it like we as a fandom was just like we are no longer listening to anything you say yeah so if you weren't already tired of you know the way that she was in regards to dumbledore this was the end of it like you were done by then and that's and like there were other things that got me done specifically because uh her turf stuff started during this time which is what we're going to get into in just a second mm -hmm. uh so like this was just coffin on the like me on the coffin that I was like you have you have expanded your will world building um world building abilities you have you have finished it that well is dry you no longer have anything uh and I can no longer do anything for you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um so like God, i remember i because we were friends when this came out and we were we were and i remember the chat that day and it was just not good <laughs> oh my gosh. it was it was it was not good it was not good it was 19 like it was years ago it, it literally was like three years ago it wasn't like a decade ago but yeah no um, but still it feels um, like it's been longer that this happened 
It does. So so a little bit after this, so after everyone made so much fun of this, Pottermore in October 2019 um, rebranded. That's why this says Wizarding World now. That's what they rebranded to um, they, because they, they got tired of hearing the Potter less joke, I, I think. I don't know. That's that's my head canon. They also, <laughs> they also opened it so it was more inclusionary because at that point, other Harry Potter um, things were in the works. Not only was the Fantastic Beasts series in the work, but there was rumor of an HBO show happening. Yeah. There was um, a possible contract conversation about another series that was happening. Um, they, they really wanted to expand the branding of the world rather than making it about Harry Potter specifically. Mm -hmm. And I am also convinced not only because of the Potter less joke, but because JK Rowling knew that she had hit the end of her well. Mm -hmm. She no longer had anything for Harry and Harry Potter. Yes. Uh, she only had she only had this left she yes. had the wizarding, she had the rest of the wizarding world left and nothing else well the theme parks are still really good you know by the way yeah. if y'all haven't but been to the, the theme park in orlando it's actually excellent <laughs> it's not harry potter world it's the wizarding world it's yeah the wizarding, and they're not even referring to it as the wizarding world of harry potter anymore it's the wizarding world yeah. Um, and, and the theme parks are great, but the theme parks, I don't think J.K. Rowling has anything to do with the theme parks. Very little, very little. Um, sh I, yeah, I doubt she's in, she's in merch negotiations. I doubt she's in lore negotiations. I doubt. No, she just, she just gets that. that, you know, that ching ching from it. Just, That's all she gets. She gets 25 that, that cash for every ticket sold. <laughs> yeah, that sticky, uh, icky cashish, you know, that's, that's her, her involvement. 25 cents for every uh, for every ticket sold and probably 10 to 15 cents for every item sold probably she, something something like that i don't know what her her deal is the deal is it with it is not public um but i'm sure she got yeah, she but, gets but a I'm payday sure it is somewhere it is a ridiculous amount <laughs> probably but we're, but don't take those numbers seriously it's don't take those numbers seriously it's not actually published anywhere there's, but yeah no something like that. like that sorry yeah okay so no worries okay so also during a lot of this during this what i'll call like the fantastic beasts era where we were all getting real damn tired also so here we go guys are you ready are y'all ready to get into the shit it's time I to get into like, the shit i would just like to ever let everyone know that i've moved from tea to coffee for this part. <laughs> all right so the turfening so also during this Fantastic Beasts era, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so during this era, she was also suspiciously liking some anti-trans tweets and following some anti-trans people on Twitter. And this was over the span of like two years, basically. So according to her um, and her publicist at the time, these were mistakes of someone who didn't understand Twitter or the internet or something. It's kind of unclear, but basically she claimed ignorance. Her publicist claimed ignorance. And the truth is a lot of people took this at face value. They thought, well, gosh, you know, cause we were still, we still had the excuse of the reason why this happened in Fantastic Beasts was because of Warner Brothers. And also the earliest like tur turf tweet that she liked was before we knew that Crimes of Grindelwald was not gonna have any gay in it, you know? Yeah. So, so a lot of people were like, yeah, y'all, like, she doesn't really know what's going on. She doesn't understand how Twitter works, even though she'd been using it for years and was super engaged in the fandom. But literally, like, that was the takes that people were, were saying. They were, like, so desperate to cling to this idea that, you know, she wasn't bad. She was just old and out of touch. That that's the kind of things they were saying. Which also, it's important to note that this kind of scandal and that kind of excuse was not uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, during the same time, a lot of politicians were getting in trouble for liking comments, um, especially here in the United States. Yep. Uh, there are some politicians who are liking porn on. <laughs> Every time a politician likes <sighs> likes porn on Twitter, like it just I don't know, like rainbows. I don't. It makes me so happy. It's like the most hilarious thing in the world. Like the, to to learn that they're horny too. Be <laughs> a fucking like lesson that if you ever become any sort of famous get a private fucking twitter account for real uh, don't put and all <laughs> and all of this by the way is sourced on jk yeah. rowling's wiki page they have a section on it and all kind of sources down in the bottom so if anything that you're saying you're like i don't remember that just 
like literally it's on the wiki page like it really so, did happen you know so while a lot of fans and a lot of people especially those part of the lgbtq community and those who were a- actual allies not early 2000 allies uh really did take this on face value this was not an uncommon excuse and because of that a lot of people there was there it was a divide some people were yeah. like maybe some people were like it'll be fine and some people are like she just might need to be educated and then there were some people who are like ah this one's trans this one's transphobic good to know mm-hmm. um and 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 for for what it's worth the 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 fans that were in these different idea camps it didn't really seem to matter if they were um lgbt themselves even if they were trans like there were trans people on every side of this debate too like it was bonkers this is how much people loved harry potter is they didn't want to admit that jk rowling's bigotry was any deeper than just she's old and out of touch um, and if and th- this makes sense if you think about the way that we that we spoke about her allyship in the early two thousands about how you know she performed this way and um, and how Harry Potter spoke so much to so many kids that were marginalized right so we didn't want to admit that maybe she was just as bad as she seemed we really and didn't that's when, and that's when people started pointing out because at this point also J.K. Rowling was on the richest people in the world's list she had already hit and topped herself on richest woman in the world uh she she had already broke in all of these records that she no longer held any sort of marginalization that she had in the beginnings of her career and mm-hmm. that's when critics started taking into consideration that the the groups that she was a part of that were marginalized by society were not necessarily groups that she didn't have control over like like and I mean that by it wasn't about her sexuality it wasn't about the color of her skin it wasn't about the systemic racism other or it, other there was nothing systemic about it other than the fact that she was a woman yeah um and her and the sexism that was against her in certain aspects everything else that she you know about being poverty about being um a single mom all of those things were things that were ha- that happened and were real to her but they weren't the way she was born if that makes sense well, and and also at this is, point, they were all in her past. Like they she, were all she, in her past. She, she had remarried. She had been done remarried by this point. Her, yeah. um, you know, and uh, and she she was a billionaire at this point. So like all of those other ways in which she faced hardships and marginalization just didn't really exist except for her gender. They you no know? longer, yeah, they no longer existed. And even when they did exist, they came from a point of privilege. Mm -hmm. she Mm -hmm. had a level of privilege that a lot of marginalized people did not have yeah she was still white um she was college educated she did have a support network um and and she did have a certain levels of privilege against her in that marginalized time and that's an important thing to consider and take it part of because that when we start reflecting upon her allyship and upon where her actions were, we, the critics of her had to start taking that into consideration in yep. a way that they hadn't taken into consideration before. Yep. And then here is where it became impossible to ignore. Yep. In December, 2019, Rowling tweeted, this wasn't liking a tweet, she tweeted her support of Maya Forstatter. So here's the story of Maya Forstatter for those that don't remember. Um, she lost her employment. Basically, she was a contract employee and they chose not to renew her contract because she had been transphobic in her workplace and made other employees that were trans uncomfortable. And so they, so the company she was working for said, all right, Maya, we're not going to renew your contract. So sorry. And she sued and she made it seem if you if you heard Maya's version of the story, she made it seem like they had fired her for protect trying to protect women. But that is not what happened. One, they didn't fire her. She was a contract employee and they chose not to renew. So they didn't end her contract earlier, anything like that. They just didn't renew it. And two, all of her things that she did to protect women were against trans women. She wasn't doing anything against men she was targeting trans women so 
it is very obvious what her real goals were. She is very obviously and clearly part of what you would call the gender critical movement, aka TERFs. So just to make sure it's super clear, I think probably at this point everyone still watching um, knows what a TERF is, but just to make sure that it's, it's clear, TERFs are, is an acronym for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist, um, which is interesting because they are neither radical nor feminists, but they love to pretend to be. So basically what they are is they're a group of rad femmes, which rad femmes are, are people with lots of varying beliefs, but um, at the end of the day, they use um, feminism in a way to oppress other people. And um, and they, they have this like very hierarchical belief that you need to lift women up above other groups of people to um, achieve the world that they want to achieve. Like they're not about gender equality. They're literally about like making women more than and it's, others. And it's so. by, and specifically biological women. Well, for TERFs, yes. Not all radical feminists okay. actually are trans exclusionary. There are definitely radical feminists that, that are not, but TERFs specifically um, believe that the best type of woman is a cis lesbian and and nobody else can um can you know a achieve that level and so they will often attack um they will attack bi women they will attack trans women they will attack non-binary people um anybody that they see that is uh that is not woman enough right like if you call yourself if you call yourself like a um a, a butch feminist and you're or sorry a, a butch lesbian and you want them want somebody to use like he him pronouns for you but you still want to be called a lesbian you know they take issue with stuff like that because that's not that's not lesbian enough you can't use our word you know so that's 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 what a turf is basically they are they're very they have this very specific um box that women go in and if you don't fit in that box then you're not a woman and they're not going to help you so that's what, so that's the kind of things that Maya Forstadter believes. Um, and, and JK Rowling tweeted that she supported her. And so then at that point, we kind of couldn't ignore it. It was like, wow, everyone who gave JK Rowling the benefit of the doubt at this point got real quiet. Yep. I, and I, and there wasn't even a, um, I don't even think it was a quiet of maybe if we don't speak right now, this will go away. Uh, it's that kind of quiet that you realize that, oh shit, I was wrong. Yeah. Because everyone who was not also in the same lane um, looked at the situation and went, yep, this is the proof I was wrong. Yeah. They were embarrassed. Some yeah. of them were heartbroken because they wanted so badly to continue to love J.K. Rowling. And now they really couldn't. But I think it was a very interesting time because there were a, there weren't a lot of people who were sitting there and defending her at that point. Nope. Um, in, later, uh, the turfs would hop on the train and and then come to her her defense. But the people that were sitting there and being like, "Oh, we don't know," she's you know using what Bree said earlier. She just hasn't reached that level of wokeness yet, or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, it's they sat there and was like, nope, you're right. This isn't okay. And they all turned against her. Pretty much. Pretty much. So basically everybody that was outspoken in the Harry Potter fandom at this point was, you know, they were on the, the JK Rowling criticism train. They were on, they were on the JK Rowling hate train or they weren't saying anything. Like there was nobody that was actually part of the Harry Potter fandom that was still supporting her at this time. Like everybody was mad and we shocked and upset. Because we all <laughs> took the lessons that had been written into the stories mm -hmm. of loving someone regardless of who they are uh, and learned from that. And then all of a sudden the person who was writing those stories completely and utterly smashed that belief yep. and everyone was shell-shocked. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't believe it. It was, it was like, it was ridiculous. Um, yeah. And, you know, it didn't stop. Like once the Maya Forstatter thing happened, it was like, boom, 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 boom. Like she could not breathe on Twitter without doing something awful. Like the yes. very, like, it, it was like literally like every couple of months she'd hop on Twitter and do something that was just like, oh my God. <laughs> I think 
became very clear that she had been, um, that obviously that these weren't accidents previously, mm-hmm. but that she had been holding her tongue. Mm-hmm. And after she let loose the gate, um, her publisher basically went, mm, there is no coming back from, not that her publisher, her, her social media manager mm-hmm. uh, basically said, there is no coming back from this. If this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. Yep. And therefore every couple of months, and it was every couple of months, there would be new tweets that were liked. There would be new, uh, you know, links to articles. Uh, there would be new, there would be new everything. And, yep. and she just, she continued to dig her heels in and continue to make it proof and proof and proof that this is what she believes. Yep. Like, for example, the next thing that she actually tweeted, this wasn't like a like or a retweet, but on in June 2020, um, so not even six months later, uh, Rowling criticized a Devereaux article, which is, um, as I understand it, a, a scientific paper. And uh, they use the phrase people who menstruate instead of women. And so she went on to tweet. This is what she tweeted. Like, it's really bad. Um, so she says, if sex isn't real, there's no same sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. And and this is all over a scientific paper about menstruation saying people who menstruate. I mean, I don't know how you get from that to like them being anti-woman. Like, you know, like she does know the pe- that women eventually go through menopause and stop menstruating, right? Like she does know that. I hope I mean, <laughs> of the age, so Consid- yeah, considering her age, like you would think, like she would know, like you know, there are plenty of cis women, you know, as women as she would call them, that don't menstruate. Obviously, yeah. children don't menstruate. Women, you know, women don't start menstruating until they they enter puberty. But then you know, not, um, they're children, which is actually something that is. Uh, not- that her her separation of that is important because it goes back to her turf beliefs yes uh, but and we'll get there in a second but yes no um she she doesn't understand because the true nature of women is that people menstruate uh and the reality is is that that's no <laughs> and like, like it's it's so it's so crazy it's so crazy to me because like you don't even you don't even have to think about like um you know uh, smaller populations like there are huge populations of people i know she would consider women that don't menstruate you don't even have to mention like well what about intersex people what about people who are on various hormone therapies you know about, like you don't even have to mention people, that what about, what about people who have had hysterectomies are they suddenly no longer women apparently if you have a hysterectomy yeah. you're not a woman anymore um, it's just who, it's so you know dumb who you know who doesn't menstruate pregnant women wow pregnant women are no longer women <laughs> like, it's just ridiculous it's just ridiculous i and... yeah no, it and she got upset like she wrote a mini essay not the infamous essay that was we're gonna get to that in a second but a mini <laughs> essay uh about that yeah um so then, okay so at this point i oh, sorry go ahead oh and then she went silent and her yeah. twitter was silent other than because at this point she had also published a children's novel mm-hmm. or a children's book where she was having kids kids submit drawings of this fictional creature she had invented uh so she went silent except for reblogging that for almost a month yeah and, and that- during that time a bunch of people came out against her that had been oh, quiet yeah. before like glad wrote an article that basically like denounced her a bunch of people that were Emma, part of the harry potter Emma franchise Watson. Emma yeah. Watson came out and wrote a huge ass essay. Yeah. Uh, wrote, Daniel wrote Radcliffe. And, uh, but would write one later after the big essay dropped. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe came out. Um, Rupert Grint came out. Um, Eddie Redmayne actress, came out around this time too. The actress from McGonagall completely, mm-hmm. which is like, you piss off uh, Madam, I can't remember her name. But yeah. Yeah, she know, did too. It's not, it's not good. <laughs> um, uh, Luna? Luna Lovegood, um, Ivana Lynch, she Ivana she Lynch. came out against her. I believe there was one actress who didn't and was pretty much crucified, but I can't even remember her. Um, yeah. I'll Google it. 
but uh well, we can talk about one other. We can talk about one other um, per, per, uh, person that didn't come out, uh, come out yeah. against her and still hasn't. So there is one Harry Potter actor who has still not come out against her, who has been silent, who has said that he will not um, make any comments on this. Um, and it is unfortunately uh, Tom Felton, and that's why every time there's a Harry Potter thing, he's like the only one that's promoting it. It's because he won't denounce her, and and. I can only assume at this point, since it's been years, that it's because he believes the same thing. Of course, we don't know I, because he's not said it, but so he, um, he either really, so, he either believes it or he really likes that Harry Potter gravy train. I think he really likes that gravy, that gravy train, uh, because he posts uh, things about um, transgender and transgender rights on social media. I mean, yeah, but so, he won't denounce so J.K. Either, Rowling. It's, it's performative. performative. It's performative. Yeah. It's performative. Any so, allyship that, that that Tom Felton shows is performative because and because he refuses to denounce J.K. Rowling. That is that is my opinion on that. I didn't know he hadn't denounced her. He That's has not. Point. He has not. And then a fan site's also pretty much every Harry Potter fan site worth its salt um, had articles on it too. Like Muggle Net had an article. Leaky Cauldron had an article. Um, basically saying, you know, their versions of "Wow, we're so super disappointed," and we denounce J.K. Rowling. Yep. No, there was, it was this big, huge goodbye to, to JK Rowling. Everyone yep. from the fandom, everyone who had any involvement pretty much just left. Yeah, basically. Um, basically. Yeah. And, and like, what also sucks uh, is that this, this is June. So this is also the very beginning of Pride Month. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later at the end of Pride Month, she drops the essay. Yes. Okay. So I will actually open the essay. It is still up. You can still find it. She's um, still oh, Landon's frozen again. Okay, I'll fix it. Thank you. Here we go. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's up with that. Anyway, here we go. So J.K. Rowling writes about her reasons for speaking out on sex and gender issues. Okay. This, this article is pretty inappropriate, BT dubs. Um, yeah. tr trigger warning of all the things that you would expect. <laughs> don't read it with, don't, don't read it if you don't need to. Yep. So she, she admits here a couple of things. She admits here a couple of things. She says, my interest in trans issues predated Maya's case by almost two years. That's around when she started liking the transphobic tweets. Interesting. Um, so basically she admits here that all of those likes that she that she did, those were real. Like what the publicist said about them being, you know, senior moments or that she didn't understand Twitter, that was not real. You know, that this this she really feels this way. Um and uh and then she goes on to say, on one level, my interest in this issue has been professional because I'm writing a crime series set in the present day, and my fictional female detective is of an age to be interested and affected by these issues herself. But on another, it's intensely personal. I'm about to explain. So what she explains in here is that and this is so this is so hard, it's so hard for me to say, because I can on one hand I can understand why she feels this way and on the other hand i'm like holy shit this is like the wrongest thing i've ever heard well, so that's basically the that's the complexity of this issue yeah. right there yeah. is there is a, a reason to have this conversation mm -hmm. the issue is is that people who are as deep entrenched in it as joanne has appeared to be will not have the conversation no and will not be willing to see anything but but what they believe is true yep so so she sets a bunch of stuff up she sets a bunch of stuff up i'm scrolling to find the thing that i'm looking for um she's crying about how she was accused of being a turf and she doesn't like that word funny well, thing about turfs you know they asked to be called turfs and then we all started calling them turfs and still making fun of them and hating on them and then all of a sudden they didn't want to be called turfs anymore uh, whatever it doesn't matter we're gonna make fun of you no matter what you call yourself because you're hateful um <laughs> uh okay so um i'm looking for let's see let me just also, find the word that it's like turf is an acronym coined by trans activists no it's not turfs it's asked not. to be called turfs my god <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so here it is. So here's here's the thing. This is why J.K. Rowling it believes what she believes. I'll read this passage. This, we're talking about abuse for a second, so bear with me. I've been in the public eye now for over 20 years and have never talked publicly, publicly about being a domestic abuse and sexual assault survivor. This isn't because I'm ashamed of those, those things happened to me, but because they're traumatic to revisit and remember. I also feel protective of my daughter from my first marriage. I don't want to claim sole ownership of a story that belongs to her too. However, a short while ago, I asked how she'd feel if I were publicly honest about this part of my life and she encouraged me to go ahead. So... What she is saying here, and she she goes on to explain in a little more detail. Um, it's linked in the in the chat if you guys want to open it up for yourself. But what she goes on to explain here is basically she was assaulted. She she has a lot of fear in her heart around men, which is perfectly understandable considering how awful her first marriage was. I, I understand. I get it. And what's pretty obvious what happened here is that she started out with a distrust towards men, read some turf shit, and fell wholeheartedly into that as a way to deal with the pain that she was holding from that trauma and decided to take it out on trans women. And I actually believe that for a lot of turfs, this is probably how it starts. They start with some, some trauma they experienced themselves and they project that out onto a group of people that they do not know or understand. And it's very likely that JK Rowling has never had a meaningful relationship with a trans person. And so it's very easy for her to hear these things that TERFs say about, you know, trans people do this, trans people do that, and believe it because she doesn't have a trans friend to say, um, I mean, maybe some trans people rolling, but not most of them calm down, you know? <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very sad story. It's a very sad story. And, um, and it's, it's sadder. It's made sadder by the fact that she doesn't understand that because she has such a huge platform and such a huge following that when she says these things, they're not just words. Like she, she's so far above at this point that she doesn't grasp that when people say, when you tweet this stuff, you're potentially causing trans women to experience violence and death. And that's true, but she can't grasp that. Like, she's so far above all of us now. She doesn't remember what it's like when somebody says, Meh, women, and what that means to women. She's the one in power now saying, Meh, trans women. And it hurts trans women. It does. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kendra. Sorry. I <laughs> I, I it. it was funny. I <laughs> uh, know that this this hurts trans women. And it also um, it makes it incredibly it, it, it hurts a lot from the point and vantage of that J.K. Rowling is a very powerful person. Mm -hmm. She has political, political power, power, like direct political power. She has direct political power, and she also has a huge, a huge amount of financial power. Mm -hmm. um, and to an extent, a lot of social power, mm -hmm. not nearly to the extent of what she did. Um, and a lot of the social power now exists with the people who agree with her and, and talk like her. Yeah. But it is this idea of once again putting the ex it's it's her lived experience she believes yeah. her lived experience should be above all uh, there is very in this essay there is no mention of intersectionality uh no mention of intersectional fe feminism at all mm -mm. Uh, which is for those of you who might not know is the uh crossroads between things like race and feminism or yeah. poverty and feminism um, anything that a two marginalized, typically race is involved, but two marginalized groups and where they meet and how that, yeah. and how that then creates a separate group of its own. And that conversation needs to exist. There isn't, that doesn't exist in this essay. She doesn't talk about it because she talks about her life events and how her perspective should be the only perspective 
Yeah. Uh, and she even kind of says that, like she even kind of says that, like she, yeah. she admits some of this stuff is true, but then, but then uplifts her, her perspective. So I'll read two paragraphs here that, that go into exactly what Landon is talking about. Um, I believe the majority of trans identified people not only pose zero threat to others, but are vulnerable in all the reasons I've outlined. Trans people need and deserve protection. Like women, they're most likely to be killed by sexual partners. Trans women who work in the sex industry, particularly trans women of color, are at particular risk. All true. All very true. Um, like every other domestic abuse and sexual assault survivor I know, I feel nothing but empathy and solidarity with trans women who've been abused by men. So I want trans women to be safe. At the same time, here's where she goes off the rails. Um, I do not want to make natal girls and women less safe. When you throw open the doors of bathrooms and changing rooms to any man who believes or feels he's a woman, and as I've said, gender confirmation certificates may not be granted without need for surgery or hormones, then you open the door to any and all men who wish to come inside, and that is the simple truth. But like, this is so harebrained, because like, think about this for a second. So basically what she's saying here is that if a man wants to go into a women's bathroom or a women's changing room and, and do some good old assaulting, you know, like he He's just he's just hankering hankering for some some sexual assault. He's he's gonna go in there, and the way that he's gonna do it is is by pretending to be a woman instead of just walking through the door. It's almost like she believes that the magic on girls' dor dormitories in Hogwarts is real, and that a man has to pretend to be a woman to walk into the the changing room or the bathroom, and that's not true. Like if they want to go in, they don't have to spend years pretending to be a woman. They can literally just walk in. Like this, this is just like so bonkers stupid. Yeah. As someone who's accidentally walked into the wrong bathroom once or twice in my life, uh, it's real easy. It's real easy. If you're not paying attention to the signs, it's real easy to be like, ah, this is the men's room. Or if you've ever tried um, to go to one of those bars that has like the weird signs that are confusing and you're like, wait, which one? Wait, like sometimes, like sometimes you open the door. Like sometimes you open the door and you're like, oh, urinals. Okay, never mind. I had no idea the sign was confusing. <laughs> Like which one's the horse, which one's the cowboy, which Yeah, yeah, like what? <laughs> oh my god. Um <laughs> but yeah, no, a hundred and ten percent of um it, it's it's ridiculous. It's this idea of that she doesn't understand that like she she obviously doesn't have any close trans friends, which is no. funny because the second essay she posts, she pretends that she does. Uh, but well, she couldn't like she couldn't possibly like the only way that she could have a trans friend is if like her trans friend is Blair White who basically makes money off of shitting on other trans people like if she has a trans friend that that must be like the type of person they are yeah no that's probably yeah um <laughs> or she made them up who knows she, she probably did that too no I think that it's it's a very old interpretation of of what it's like to live in society these days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also not exp not understanding the live the live life of a trans person, not willing to listen to the live life of a trans person, not willing to consider intersectionality in any of this. Mm -mm. Uh, it, it literally is my life as a woman was hard because I was abused, and now all men and anybody who's lived any type of life with, as a man can no longer be trusted. Yep. Uh, because what's very fascinating about this and interesting about it. Uh, which is true with most TERFs, there is no mention of trans men. In no, this it's like they her, pretend that that doesn't exist. <laughs> her second essay or, or the supportive tweets that she she then continued to give out uh, in July and August of, of 2020, uh, she mentions the idea of people who are not... <laughs> Who, uh, of women who are who have lived life as a woman and now being referred to as men uh, and trans, basically trans men. However, she doesn't want to call them that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's again, very turf-like to sit there and be like, no, trans men don't exist. It's just that women don't want to be, the life is, is that women don't want to be women uh, because of how society treats women. And therefore, they think it will be easier if they're a man, uh, which is the turf thinking. Yeah, like they really feel like, for the most part, at least the the turf stuff that I've seen on this, they they think of trans men as like lost sisters. They yeah. don't think of them as as men or as as people who are are being honest about 
their own thoughts and feelings. And it doesn't seem to matter whether they're talking about like young trans men or old trans men. They just they just believe like they're lost and they don't understand themselves, which doesn't really make sense to me. Like, how could you say how could you say that? And and why does it matter? I don't know. It just this boggles my mind because I, I am very much a somebody that is not super into labels. Um, they've not really done me a lot of good in my life. They just cause confusion. I find it much better to use sentences when describing myself. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but right. you know if if somebody if somebody says I am this or, or I am that or my identity is this or that, like to me it does not matter how ridiculous it sounds to me. It, it's just like how does it hurt anything to just say okay. And just treat them how they ask to be treated. It doesn't hurt anybody. Because, well, for, for this particular, as written in the essay, she, you could have, she could, she feels that the idea of being a woman is being, like, lessened upon because of men like like that sorry that was not how I meant to say that no I think uh, what I, I get what you're trying to say like she she that, she deeply understands she, that being a woman very, is lesser than being a man in our society but she's she's almost yes absolutely which it is but she's almost victimizing that to an even greater extent extent mm-hmm. right she is she is playing into her own victimization of the sexism that exists within our society. Yeah, and you can Um, so see this. You can so see this in in there, because here's the passage. Um, Here's the passage where she goes into that. Um, She says, the writings of young trans men reveal a group of notably sensitive and clever people. The more of their accounts of gender dysphoria I've read with their insightful descriptions of anxiety, disassociation, eating disorders, self-harm and self-hatred, the more I've wondered whether if I had been born 30 years later, I too might have tried to transition. The allure of escaping womanhood would have been huge. I struggled with severe OCD as a teenager. If I'd found community and sympathy online that I couldn't find in my immediate environment, I believe I could have been persuaded to turn myself into the son my father had openly said he would have preferred. Like there is so much pain in this passage that it is very hard for me to read this and not instantly identify. Being a woman is really hard and it really sucks. And I do wish that more women had an opportunity to really think about their gender and explore that within themselves and make those decisions without patriarchy also getting in the way. But that's not the world that we live in and that doesn't exist. And if somebody wants to be a man for reasons of they think it will make their life easier, why is that not a valid reason? Why is that not just as valid as because of them experiencing dysphoria? Why? Yeah, or at least... And it's it's also trivializing trivializing the um, the experience, right? Mm-hmm. In that one paragraph, and it's it it's so obvious that she comes from a place of hurt and pain, and she blames her own womanhood for it. And there is a lot of it that is like her womanhood is to possibly blame, right? The fact that she was uh, she was in a marriage like and and wasn't as strong as the as her husband or or who knows her husband sexually harassed or assaulted like that is all yes because she is woman which sucks and is is terrible but that doesn't mean that her struggle is anything more than that of someone who's trying to transition mm-hmm. um and it, and that that hating herself and hating the situation and societal place that being a woman has put her in doesn't like that doesn't equate to wanting to be a man it doesn't it really doesn't doesn't understand that no she's like oh if i was just if i was just in this generation where it's okay to transition i would have transitioned but you don't know that you You don't know that (laughs) you don't know that and and here's the thing like and she even she even kind of like backtracks a little bit so she admits this is another piece that i want to read Um, I want to be very clear here. I know transition will be a solution for some gender dysphoric people, although I'm also aware through extensive research that studies have consistently shown that between 60 and 90 percent of gender dysphoric teens will grow out of their dysphoria. Again and again, I've been told to just meet some trans people. I have. 
in addition to a few younger people who are all adorable. I happen to know a self-described transsexual woman who's older than I am and wonderful, although she's open about her past as a gay man. I've always found it hard to think of her as anything other than a woman, and I believe she's completely happy to have transition. So, like, this also, is the thing, like... Talk about, oh, sorry, there's an adjective in there, self-described. How, like, even in this article where she's like, yeah, I know trans people. She's like, this person only considers themselves trans. <laughs> Like, it's crazy sorry. it's crazy well it's and also like she's like so she's so up on like teens wanting to transition and how a lot of dysphoric teens well, grow yeah. out of it but you know what teens teens are all teens are going through self-discovery so of course a lot of them are not going to turn out to be trans but again i don't see why that's a problem most teens are different when they're adults in all of their identity like why does gender have to be different it's well, just crazy that was a huge part of it is because after this essay was released, she then released a series of up to 20 tweets, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I have the link on my phone. So if I, I can link it, I figure yeah, out. Yeah, put it, put it in but, the chat. We can pull that up too. Um, but it basically is talking about uh, hormone therapy and how it is like con conser uh, conservation camps nope yeah so basically like it's bad for teens to have hormone therapy access yeah but see that's uh, so dumb because then she misunderstands what yeah. what teens in hormone therapy go through so if you're not aware when when a doctor puts a teen on hormone therapy they typically don't get put on like estrogen or or um testosterone typically what happens is they get put on puberty blockers so that they can delay puberty for a few years while they're kind of working out the gender dysphoria right so Basically, what that means is is that um, they get a chance to really think about it and decide because if it turns out they are really trans, going through puberty could be really traumatic for them. So you go on the puberty blockers for a few years, and then once you've decided you you're you're good and you you know what you want to do, um, then you can go on the uh, on whatever hormones or just go come off the puberty blockers. And the thing that happens then is then your puberty starts, right? Like if you decide, oh, I'm not trans, I am cis, you come off the puberty blockers, your puberty starts it catches up it's really it's literally no problem and we've been using puberty blockers for non-trans kids as well sometimes kids you know start puberty when they're like way too young <laughs> and those kids get put on puberty blockers too like it's not a big deal it's it's it happens it's not this mysterious unknown pill for trans people like it's used all the time yeah for a um, variety of reasons for a variety of of reasons and it yeah, yeah. exactly it's just Here's, so here's the tweets. So tell me if there's a certain one you want it, you want me to scroll to. Oh, no, it's just the articles that she links and everything like that. I think people yeah. just need to have access to it as far as being like, no, there is. She just talks about how. Um, yeah, that is just it's bad for kids. <laughs> yeah, but it's literally uh, not. And, We've been doing this for years. Things, and that like kids are too young to know what they want and all of these things. And it's like, that's that's not true. And that's her big thing. Like she she took a lot of slack this happened in in july she had just published the thing the article a week earlier or two weeks earlier she had been getting a lot of criticism this was just her doubling down again so mm -hmm. not only did she like she got a lot of criticism on the fact that this is about her life and her perspective and not taking into account other people so part of that like doubling down is adding in like well it's unsafe for children like that, that is literally was, not <laughs> like I guarantee uh, most little most girls um, before they turn 18 have gone on some kind of hormones because even if you even if you didn't go on hormones for any other reason most girls before they get 18 get put on the pill you know yeah. to prevent right. pregnancy a that's a hormone it's a hormone block <laughs> literally it's this is it's so stupid like it just gives me like oh it just makes my head hurt so yes um this thread pretty much it's it's exactly it's exactly what landon said yeah it's just like her saying but look at all these other people who agree with me yes and and it's and it's again like sitting there and being like because her because her whole essay that is about how terrible it has been for her to be called a turf and how her experience uh, makes it so that it's understandable that she puts women above all. Like, mm -hmm. it, when that wasn't well received, she then doubled down with this, well, being trans is dangerous for other people too. 
Yeah. So it's not just, it's not just dangerous for women. It's also dangerous for children. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, that's not, that's not true. <laughs> this is totally not true. Um, and then also like, and then like that whole thing too, is that there's the contradiction in there that in her essay, she's so angry about the fact that England has changed the law that you can have gender confirmation certificate without gender confirmation, cir- uh, without surgery or without even being on hormones. And she's pissed and angry about that because she believes that that will then magically allow men into bathrooms, um, into women's bathrooms. And she's angry about that, but now she's also at the same time, doesn't want people to go on hormones. Yep. And the, and it, the thing is, is at the end of the day, she just doesn't want trans people to exist. Pretty much like she just does. She just thinks trans people are icky. Like that's really what this boils down to. She is, she is, tr- she is traumatized from what happened to her during her first marriage. And she thinks trans people are icky and she's taking it out on them. I mean, that's well, really no, what this is. Yeah. And I mean, the correlation is that she thinks men is are icky and then the reason why, the only reason she could think of men wanting to be women because she views women as inferior because of her lived experiences. And then so now was trying to like convince the world that women aren't inferior. So she's like, why would trans women want to be women? Oh, it's because they must want to attack women. Right. And she's, she's like, and it's she's like, like wants- this really convoluted yes. process. <laughs> Yes, and and to add to that, like she 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 wants to pretend like she's this feminist that cares about women so much, and I just I struggle to I struggle to grasp that because I mean Harry Potter, like all the female characters in Harry Potter, like there's so many great ones. I mean, like, yeah. uh... <laughs> like, uh, yeah, no, she. Um, she, uh, I can't think of any right now, but. <laughs> No, she doesn't, she doesn't care about women because if she did care about women, there would be some sort of intersectionality as far as race goes in her feminism, which there Mm -hmm. isn't. There would be some level of uh, not looking at fat phobia the way that she does because women are, you know, told to be skinny by the society that is, that is Mm -hmm. trying to keep them down. Yep. I mean, um, fat phobia hurts men too, but it hurts women absolutely. disproportionately. But, it does. But the, the level of her, like there would be some level of thinking about women beyond her own experience. Yes, which like, she doesn't ra- do. Like racism affects men too, but it's, it is like, she's not, she is thinking of as a white woman who was poor and is no longer poor, how has being a woman held her down? Yep. That is and during, from. Yep, and during all of this, like you would think like, oh, she's getting so much criticism. Maybe she'll take a chance to think about it. Maybe she'll take an internet break, but she doesn't. And here's why she doesn't. I want to go, we're going back to the essay real quick. Yeah. Um, so here's why she she doesn't take any of the criticism, why she she doesn't think like, well, gosh, every single Harry Potter actor is abandoning me. Um, why why she doesn't like why that doesn't make her take a step back. So what I didn't expect in the aftermath of my cancellation was the avalanche of emails and letters that came showering down upon me. The overwhelming majority of which were positive, grateful, and supportive. Okay, so this is what happened. Have access to Twitter. (laughs) Okay, so this is what happened. So she started. She started doing this turf shit, right? She started doing this turf shit, and then the turf saw this and went, "Time to love bomb." Time to love bomb her. And they literally like did, they just showered her with praise upon praise upon praise for what she was doing, for like speaking out about this thing that they think is so important. So like, she thinks these are fans. Like she thinks these are Harry Potter fans that have like been following her for years and they're telling her they support her. It's not, it's turfs, it's turfs. No, I mean, I'm sure there are some, right? There are probably some ter- turf Harry Potter fans, but these people that are love bombing her are not doing it from a place of fandom. They're doing it because they're turfs. Yep, they're doing it because they saw someone with a woman, a cis, let's like be honest, the dream woman, a cis woman with power, mm-hmm. a cis white woman with power. Uh, they saw this woman and was like, wow, she's finally speaking out for me. The turfs are treating her like we treated her in 2003. It's just the beginning of a new cycle. Yep. And then uh, she and she loves it, obviously. Oh yeah. And why wouldn't you? I mean, like at that point too, for her, that's when she was the most famous and respected. That's when the most people, as a person who is who is a vict- who considers them a victim, 
you want people rallying around you. Yep. Uh, and the most people rallied around her and did not criticize her in the early 2000s where everyone loved her. And that's what she wants. So that's what the TERFs are doing. Yep. And she views it as fans. And the reality is, is that, Joanne, if, if you hadn't been outspokenly trans and had continued to just silently like tweets, no one would like you. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terse wouldn't like you and we certainly wouldn't like you uh so yeah it's just this it's just a fucking mess yeah um it's and a big mess she's continuing to post shit on on twitter mm -hmm. um she continues to double down on her behavior yeah she continues to uh show support for anti-trans movements she still mm -hmm. hates being called a turf so we should call her turfs as much as possible yep um and oh and then like earlier later that year uh she published a book where the killer was a man in a dress mm -hmm. uh, yep. that's the crime, crime novel that's the crime novel that she was talking about that she'd been working yeah. on so she she published it late last year early this year Yep. And it turned out that it, it's not a trans character. It is a man in a dress. Yep. Uh, so even refusing to give the character the title of trans. Yep. And I don't know why. It's like her book is literally like uses uses the trope, the it's the silence of the lambs trope that's like, you know, uh, I'd fuck me. Like we all know, like Buffalo Bill from, from Silence of the Lambs. So like it's been done the best it could possibly be done. Why she is treading over this trope with such like, like reckless abandon i don't understand but it's like it's so dumb so i have not read the book obviously but um i have i have watched some youtube videos reading ex excerpts of it and um it, i mean it sounds like it's really awful on top of just being super transphobic so you know that's great love that for her she i don't know why she's doing mystery books because mystery books exist in this world that's already been built and that is not her strong suit no um, so she's, she's not a good writer <laughs> Well, she just, uh, what, what she, what she wants to write and what she's good at, at writing are like two completely different things. And she can't like reconcile that within herself. And, but of course she's a billionaire. She doesn't have to. That's the other thing that really upsets me about JK Rowling. Like, I just feel like, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I'm like thinking of this, like two rose colored glasses, but I feel like if I got to the level where I was a billionaire, I would just quietly retire and just mind my own fucking business you know, and just live right. off of that. But she just can't do it. I agree. However, the rise to power as suddenly and as swiftly as it is to the extent of how much power and people listen to her and the amount of time that she has spent on social media because she has been on social media since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So she's definitely social media poison just like the she rest of us. That unlike you or perhaps anybody uh, who's already involved, um, she she's a narcissist yeah she's it's become like, one. at the end of the day she is a narcissist and I, it's uh, so sad because i feel like the money made her that way you know what i mean oh yeah no i mean it was the it was the recovery of abuse right it was yeah. all of a sudden she was being abused she was left she was poor she was broken she had no one in her corner to the whole world loves her to the world whole world hates her mm -hmm. like that that swing in a lifetime would put anybody uh, would fuck up anyone's mental illness. Yep. And she just wants to continue to be heard because she felt silented for so long. Mm -hmm. And of uh, her own, uh, playing into her own victimhood, uh, that she she just feels like she can continue to talk. So she'll continue to write books. She'll continue to canonize Harry Potter things that we don't want. Uh, she'll continue to reblog surf shit. And unfortunately, because she has the political and financial power, she yeah. will make a difference in these political movements. Yeah, I mean, she already has. Like, here's here's something that was a direct, uh, directly from her essay um, that, that happened as a result of her essay. So on the 19th of June, 2020, the Equality Act was blocked in the U.S. Senate after Republican Senator James Lankford opposed it. And he cited Rowling's essay as part of his reasoning. Right. So like these things, these things are not words that she's saying in a vacuum. This is not her, you know, problematically navigating her trauma. This really this is literally um, affecting policy that will hurt trans people 
it's just and she can't understand this she can't understand it and i do and i do feel for you know it, it, the position of where she's a creative and she's realized that she can't make anything else now but harry potter and nobody cares about it unless she makes harry potter and that's got to be a really there. tough place to be in um oh yeah you know, as a as a creative that really can't create anymore like that's got to suck but that can't come at the I'm expense of an entire lie. group of people i'm not going to lie um jk rowling's existence would be my own personal hell <laughs> Being the life that she lives knowing that the best of your art is behind you mm -hmm. and no matter which way you move you cannot move in the right direction yep. you can no longer create uh also she never really wanted to be an author so she fell into it but that's fine um it just, but she's still a creative person i mean no, she, she's, she's always been somebody that written that's written she's said that before absolutely. no she but it's just in that in general thing where it's like then create different kind of art mm -hmm. um yeah, so it's just this whole thing of, it just, it sucks. It would suck, absolutely. Uh, and she is going to decline in her own tower and she will never change because she will never need to. Yeah. And the problem is, is that she is so rich that she will continue to donate money. Mm -hmm. So not just political power, but donate money into funds that will stop things so if there is a ban on hormones or a law that's going to pass hormones so that teenagers can't get uh puberty blockers for trans for transitioning purposes she will throw money behind it yeah and she has enough money to throw money that will make a difference Yep. And it's really sad. It's really sad because that is that is all she's really known for now. I mean, the best that anyone with any similar power ever says about her now is like, well, she is getting a lot of abuse for this and maybe we shouldn't be like constantly hate tweeting her. Like that's the best anyone can say any about her right now. And that's really sad. I don't. And that then what you say to that person is I don't hate tweet her. I just don't think about her. <laughs> 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 the thing that will kill JKR more than anything is the thing that will kill any narcissist and that is fading into obscurity yep. Uh, yep. and unfortunately it will take a very long time for that to happen because she was so famous and remains to be so famous like mm -hmm. like even if we even if the original people that gave her her power have turned against her 90% of the fandom it she's still powerful yeah <laughs> Yep. She still uh, is. I mean, I mean, we're still we're still dealing with it. I mean, part of the reason that we're making this episode and talking about her is because um, Landon and I both have a personal stake in this, you know, it, for, for better or for worse. The things that, that she does um, do affect me, uh, you know, whether I want them to to or not, even as somebody that she's not directly targeting, you know, she probably thinks someone like me, she's probably helping. Right. Um, cause, cause like her, I'm not, uh, you know, being a woman has not always done the best for me. Right. Um, so she probably thinks like the things that she's doing would, would help someone like me, but, but it doesn't, uh, it just hurts. It just hurts for, for somebody that I, I thought understood what it was like, you know, to be marginalized and that we should lift everyone up regardless of what makes them marginalized, um, doesn't actually feel that way. Yeah. It's. I think for me, it's the reckoning of a dream. I wanted to be J.K. Rowling. I wanted to write the new Harry Potter series. I wanted to affect them, affect the world in such a way that J.K. Rowling affected uh, us, mm -hmm. that rose and raised a generation and built a safe place for a generation. Uh, I, that, is, that is what I've always wanted to be. Uh, and now as an adult, realizing that that person isn't that thing. Mm -hmm. is like it I don't know it feels worse than like realizing your parents are human right yeah. um, <laughs> it, it, it's like a weird it's a weird worse version of that because not only is is she human but she's also a terrible human yeah unfortunately I mean I guess I can take solace in the fact that um at least I'll outlive her you know there will be some I day that. That there will be some so day this morning uh, yeah, and, there will be some day that um, that that I'm still living in this world and she's not, and I can enjoy Harry Potter things completely guilt free at that point. And I know that there is a lot of um, like talk and conversation about how can what can we do to stop her. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is, is there is not much one person can do. No, nope. uh, just you know, unfollow her on Twitter. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't react to anything she's done. Do your best to not buy uh, Harry Potter merch. Um, as someone who's gone to Harry Potter world and, and likes Harry Potter merch, I understand that that is difficult, but the money does directly go back to her mm -hmm. uh, to an obscene extent, extent, even though we don't have that money. It, it has been rumored that it is a good deal. Mm -hmm. um, and do your best to just separate the thing that she helped create but did not build from her. Yeah. And obviously Harry it's Potter. hard. Like, I oh, mean, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it successfully. I'm on here talking about Harry Potter and we're going to read the rest of the books. And like, we're going to, you know, we're going to do that. We're going to make that content. Um, you know, so obviously it's not something, it's not something that's easy to do or something that I'm even fully able to do. But, you know, at the, at the same time, I, I do feel like, I feel like for me, the best way to, uh, to help is to, you know, ensure people understand where this stuff comes from, why turf ideology is so dangerous and how it hurts and um and uh and kind of doing that because I think I think it's so easy for you to get wrapped up in a lot of these turf ideas just because you've been through pain. We've talked about this before in other aspects as well, like when we talk about aunties, um a lot of aunties learn what they they learn from turfs, you know, and it all comes from that you're you're in pain and you've had trauma and uh and you you see the turf stuff as a way to alleviate that pain and trauma and um but it doesn't it just hurts trans people yeah. hurts them a lot mm -hmm. so uh treat trans people like people because they are and be a better ally than that yeah <laughs> the end of the day um yep. but yeah i think that it's important we're coming up on two hours um, but I think it's important that to remind ourselves that bigotry, bigotry does not tend to stay in its own lane. Um, as you know, she has received support for being anti-trans. She's also going to be influenced and her ideology to an extent will continue to get worse and not better. People don't become more liberal in their, in their um, old age. <laughs> typically they become more, typically people become more conservative as they get richer and she is very, very rich. But, uh, yes, and um, they become more like the circles that they are involved in. Mm -hmm. I should say that. Uh, you become more influenced by the circles that you have cemented yourself in and the circles that she has cemented herself in have already been proven to be anti-trans. She has already been proven to have some levels of anti-LGBTQ uh, and will probably continue to get worse. Yeah, probably. So don't be surprised. If um, in five years, she's not just talking about how much, um, how dangerous trans people are, but she's talking about how dangerous um, all queer people are. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I would, uh, because I don't think, um, I think trans is still an issue in society that is appropriate to debate. I don't think being queer is, and well, I don't think it will continue to be. I don't However, know. <laughs> I'm surprised if there continue to be more hints towards that. I don't think she'll ever come out and say that because I don't think it will it will be societally accepted to say those things. I don't know. I think she could. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Whereas, like being um, being anti trans by a lot of people is still like considered a conversation exactly. worth having, yes. um, even though it's not. And oh, don't. absolutely. Not. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll have this conversation. But as far as like. Like there is, there is no more, even here in American politics, politicians no longer debate whether queer people can get married. Uh, like that, like ever since that was passed in 2012. That's true, uh, they kind of given up on it. They, they're kind of like, okay, this is no longer the thing to defend. <laughs> uh, it's, I think that it's heading in that direction. And hopefully one day we will live in a world where this being trans is a non-conversation that it doesn't yeah. need to happen or raise any eyebrows or it's not up for debate and that turfs are just, you know, the angry, the angry is of the world. And it's like, yeah. okay. Like you think, like we get to a point where we think they're super weird, you know, like how like hardcore evangelicals will be like super anti-gay marriage. And at this point, everyone thinks that's really weird, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um. All right, this has been a very heavy show, guys. I really appreciate everybody who's um who's still with us. It's good to talk about these things. Um, and also, I'm glad that we did this because uh, we are going to continue to read Harry Potter and mm -hmm. discuss it. 
Uh, and it is this thing that deserves its own spotlight, but it is also like, okay, this is, this is a lot to also put in with the Harry Potter discussion. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do we want to do a, a good news article today? I feel like, I feel like we probably should. Do you have one? Do we need to find one? I'm finding one. Okay. Oh, so, um, <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Brie. I really appreciate your comment. Uh, this is really hard to talk about, you know, I feel, I guess when it comes to me, I was, when this started happening a couple of years ago, I had so much anger in my heart for her. Um, and, uh, and I still do, but yeah. I just feel like my energy, I don't want my energy to go there. I want my energy to go into, you know, positive things. So, uh, it's been nice to get this off my chest. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's been, um, it's been an interesting development and just relationship with this in the last few years. Yeah. Uh, as someone, because Harry Potter, I mean, it's, it's important to both of us, but like when I say that Harry Potter, I would not be who I am without that book series. I am not exaggerating. Yeah, me I, either. I would not have the people. I would not have the friends. I would not have the emotional maturity. I would not probably, I don't know where I would be, but I would not be who I am. Uh, so being, so being able to separate the fandom and the community that I have built with these books versus the person who created them mm -hmm. uh, is very cathartic and nice to talk about and okay to understand and be able to develop and dissect uh, and, and have a community of people who are willing to do that. Yes. Thank you so much for the applause, Katie. Um, I think it played twice, so thank you so much. Now Landon can live another, another week as we know. <laughs> hey, um, so fun facts. Okay. I will be playing another game of Where in the World is Landed next week. Oh! Three people know. So okay. Just, I figured y'all can guess in the chat or somewhere. I don't know. All right. Guess, guess is where she's going to go next week. All right. So here's our, here's our good news article. So lullabies can actually improve the health of premature babies in the hospital and their family's health too. Oh, I this is so that. sweet. I, was like, I haven't read it, but I was like, oh, lullabies small children babies this is what i need <laughs> oh my god this is so cute no but it's true though like music has a bunch does a bunch of like really magical things in the brain like it sounds like it sounds like magic but like it can like unlock memories it can solidify memories it it, ha it can have a healing effect um and and yet this all sounds like pseudoscience but it's it's really not like they've studied this and there is a measurable effect like you know you don't try to cure someone with music but um it can help you know in a, in conjunction with actual treatment <laughs> and i assume uh, that's what this is saying too yes it's basically saying that but it's also saying like any kind of slow relaxing song so even like sad songs uh have been like impactful Oh. Uh, which is hysterical wow uh, i guess a baby wouldn't know if it's like a happy so thing. song song or a sad song would they yeah the <laughs> last thing like you want to be listening to in the hospital as your baby is you know tuned up is is to be like some country slow song <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um but also just like i love sad music so this is good for me when i'm a future mom mm -hmm. uh, now you know Sad music is good good for babies that are uh, healing. But yeah, just I think overall, just sing lullabies, love children. That's all I've got for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is really nice. All right. Okay, guys. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate it. This was something that we had really wanted to talk about and kind of um, get through and uh, and help everybody, you know, understand where we were coming from That's with this customer, stuff. Not me. And, oops, One, sorry, two, I was three, gonna try four, to find somebody five. to raid while I was talking and I didn't realize Twitch wasn't muted. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> that just interrupted my, my heartfelt thank yous. <laughs> but I really do appreciate you guys being here. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate this. And I appreciate that this is a stream where we can talk about this stuff. I love yes. this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, tune in uh, as a reminder, tune in next week. We're going to be doing our topic of the month next week, uh, which is Mulan versus Mulan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Mulan versus Mulan. And don't forget afterwards, we're having four hours of party time. It's going to oh, be a party. <laughs> I yes. my friends. It'll be wonderful. Uh, <laughs> it'll be good. So, yep. And then I can also talk about how much Stardew Valley has taken over my life. Oh my god, so y'all, she's an addict now, since we played on the stream, um, she's, oh my gosh, thank you so much for the biddies, Katie, I love you, I love you so much. 
Um, yeah, we got Landon totally addicted. So thank you, Kendra and Katie, for helping with that last week. <laughs> it's so bad, but I love it. <laughs> uh, yep, and of course, on next Thursday's um, stream, we'll be doing some more uh, Final Fantasy X, so come join me for that on Thursday. Um, and Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me at Twitter slash Landon Main. I can, oh, thank you. I was just about to do that. I was racing uh, you. <laughs> on Instagram and uh, yeah, that's, and a TikTok sometimes. But yeah. mostly, mostly Twitter right now. It's pretty hot takey. It's not even mm-hmm. hot takey. I'm funny. I'm talking about Stardew Valley and therapy. So mm-hmm. it's hilarious. There's all my socials. Y'all know how it works. Um, all the ways to support me. I do everything else, everything like every other content creator. Uh, you know, subscribe to my YouTube, follow my Twitch, all that fun stuff. Um, awesome. You guys know what to do. Yeah. Also, uh, if you could send me good thoughts this week, I will have children for the first time since the beginning of summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, new, the new year starts and I'm hoping to not kill them before Thursday. Okay, good luck. Uh, <laughs> but I'm seeing all of all of you and I love you all. All right. Well, guys, since um, Sims was totally broken on my computer today, we are actually going to raid into my favorite Sims 2 streamer. She took a break for a while for um, for mental health reasons. So please tell her you you love her and um, and that she looks beautiful. Anyway, her name is Pleasant Sims. We've raided into her before. She's way bigger than me, so she's, she might not even realize. She might not even acknowledge the raid, but mm, Simpai, please notice me. <laughs> but I want to make sure y'all get to watch some Sims 2 um, since I totally, my computer totally failed today and we did not not uh get any there was so here we go there's that fly oh my god <laughs> <laughs> all right guys here we go raid starting in just a little bit but thank you so much for joining us today and don't forget of course as always to make it a great day and don't forget to be awesome all right bye guys have fun bye. watching some sims too